Good afternoon. I'm Nathan Lujan, ROM's Associate Curator of Fishes, broadcasting live from ROM's basement. I'm delighted you could join us for today's Curator Conversation, a digital program that explores the themes and subjects uh, from ROM collections alongside in industry professionals. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that the ROM sits on what has been the ancestral lands of the Windat, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Anishinaabek Nation, including the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, since time immemorial to today. Today's program explores local invasive species and the current and upcoming threats they pose to Ontario's freshwater ecosystems. For those of you interested in our local waterways, ROM has just released this new fantastic edition of a field guide to the freshwater fishes of Ontario, the definitive guide to Ontario freshwater fishes. You can find out more through the link in the chat. I'd like to thank the Department of Fisheries and Oceans for their contributions to this new edition, and we'll be hearing more about DFO work uh, during the conversation today. I'm really excited about today's conversation because it focuses on invasive species in our Great Lakes, a really important issue, especially the dreaded Asian carps. You may have heard earlier this year that the federal government is investing $20 million in Asian carp research and prevention. That's on top of millions of dollars previously. If you're at all curious about how those federal investments are being spent, I think you'll find today's guest fascinating. I'd like to welcome Department of Fisheries and Oceans Senior Aquatic Biologist, David Marzen. David Marzen has been working with Fisheries and Oceans Canada uh, in, since 2002 and has worked as both a fisheries technician and biologist during that time. His initial focus was on fish species at risk, but has now shifted the focus of his work to invasive species. As the field operations lead for the organization's Asian carp program, David supervises a group of biologists, technicians, and students in Asian carp early detection surveillance efforts in the Canadian waters of the Great Lakes Basin. During today's program, you could submit questions for us via the Q&A feature on screen. David and I are gonna chat for a while, and then we'll get to some of those audience questions later. Um, so anything that, that uh, stimulates your curiosity, feel free to put in the chat window. So welcome, David. Um, I'd like to start off with just a very broad question about the terminology surrounding invasive species. So there's a lot of words thrown around around these species native, naturalized, introduced, alien, invasive species. What are the differences in, in these different categories of fishes that in the Great Lakes? Sure. Um, well, thank you for having me to start with. Um, yeah, so I'll start with, uh, so native species would be considered those that are you know, in, indigenous to a water body. They've been there in, in some cases for thousands of years and evolved, evolved uh, with that ecosystem, that environment. And they've kind of, you know, always been there. So that's what we would consider a native species. Um, introduced or alien species are ones that um, have arrived into a system that they weren't, you know, originally part of. So it's not necessarily that they're coming from, you know, across the world and, and gaining access to an area. It's just, it could be, you know, an adjacent water body that they've, you know, those populations have never mixed. They've never had that particular species. Um, sorry, I'm always fish, thinking fish in my head because that's what I do. So. A lot of my stuff is is tends towards fish, but uh, but yeah, so so a species that that hasn't been there previously could be uh, uh, an introduced or alien species. Um, you know, if if uh, an introduced species is is there a long time, uh, it establishes, it, it spreads, um, and you know has reproducing populations. After an amount of time, they consider those as uh, to be naturalized. So. You can think, um, you know, common carp in the Great Lakes. They've been there, you know, well over 100 years. They're really all over the place. They're breeding in, in different areas. There are many interconnected channels. You see them, so they're very widespread. Um, you know, also I'll flag as one of our look-alike species for Asian carp that we often uh, uh, do mention. Um, and then uh, invasive species are ones that cause, you know, a significant negative impact to you know, either socioeconomic or environmental impact to the areas where they invade. So it's that that real negative component to the, the species coming in that makes them invasive or, or identified as invasive. 
So the goldfish or the common carp would be another type of Asian carp that's not necessarily invasive and that's not necessarily the focus of these ongoing efforts to, uh, to eradicate uh, or prevent the introduction of, of species in, in the Great Lakes. Yeah, we don't, we don't include them in our definition of Asian carps. Um, so Asian carps uh, are, you know, grass carp, black carp, silver carp, and big head carp. Um, and these, those are the, the four invasives that we're particularly concerned with. Um, yeah, as far as common carp, they, again, they've been here a long time. They're widely distributed and, um, you know, considered naturalized at this point, yeah. So, so you mentioned range expansion as being one avenue for, for these invasive species getting into the Great Lakes. What are the different ways in which, how do these species get here? Well, how do they arrive in the Great Lakes? Yeah, there's, I mean, there's a number of different uh, opportunities for, for species to get in. So often, um, you know, there, there's both intentional and unintentional uh, means for them to get in. So think of water gardens, um, you often think of goldfish or koi, um, as well as decorative plants that, you know, people enjoy to, you know, beautify their, 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 their property. Um, and many of those species are not, uh, you know, indigenous to these, the surrounding areas. So be it uh, an intentional release because people think the plants are, are beautiful, not realizing that they can have uh, a real negative impact on the natural environment. People could be releasing them or you can have flooding events. And that's kind of what happened with the, the uh, you know, big head and silver and black carp. They were in uh, aquaculture ponds for, um, you know, purposely brought in to help clean up waters or deal with parasites. And during flooding events of the lower Mississippi, they escaped into the, the natural, you know, environment and were able to expand from there. Um, but there's a number of other ways too with, you know, you know, the Niagara Falls was a great barrier between Lake Ontario and Lake Erie, but, uh, you know, when the Welland Canal was created, that gave, you know, fishes, again, uh, fishes themed, but that gave an opportunity for them to pass, you know, uh, uh, bypass Niagara Falls and, and connect those two Great Lakes. Um, you know, there's the, the food fish industry, there's uh, um, any number of different ways that, that fishes uh, or other organisms can be introduced. And even, you know, a big threat, um, zebra mussels too, where they can attach to, to boats. And if somebody's in an area that's infected and don't properly clean their boat and go somewhere else, then that's an opportunity for them to be uh, introduced as well. Again, not intentionally, um, but it happens, right? They can hitchhike uh, through and, and ballast water and ships is another method that's, you know, kind of a, a well-known one for fishes to get into the Great Lakes. So, so how, how big of a problem are these species in the Great Lakes? You know, why, why should we be concerned about this issue? Um, well, because they can have very, you know, significant negative impacts to the Great Lakes. So a couple of common examples that probably many people have heard of are like sea lamprey and uh, zebra mussels. So sea lamprey, when they arrived to the upper Great Lakes, had, you know, catastrophic impacts on, on many of the fish species. So a lot of the native fish species weren't accustomed to this new predator that entered the system. And um, they, you know, the, the sea lamprey had an abundance of food. There was tons of fish for them to attach to and, and feed on and it caused a lot of, you know, high mortalities, which really impacted the commercial recreational fisheries as well. You know, we just saw a, a significant, significant collapse in, in fisheries. Um, zebra mussels, on the other hand, um, very, very small, easy, you know, for them to move around, but they really, they cluster in different areas. And uh, so they um, would really compete with native mussel species for one. Uh, I would compete them, they, they feed heavily, they reproduce quickly, they would attached to many, you know, uh, solid structures. So we see that in a lot of invaded lakes, um, you know, in the, in the Corthas and stuff like that, where you have these clusters of shells and, um, you know, for water users, it's very unpleasant to have these sharp shells there as well. So, you know, they're impacting the native um, biodiversity uh, as well as, you know, making, you know, near shore experiences, uh, uh, less pleasant with those sharp little shells that you got to, you know, be mindful of. So, and I mean, there's many, many other impacts as well. Um, more relevant to, to my particular focus is, is grass carp. And it's a species that uh, there are, you know, a couple of populations in the Western basin of Lake Erie that are reproducing. Um, and we're, you know, particularly concerned about them because of their ability 
to, you know, they grow very quickly, they reproduce quickly, um, they eat a lot of vegetation so that, you know, they live up to their name, grass carp, they feed on vegetation, but these fish grow up to 80 pounds in weight and eat up to 40% of their body weight daily. So, you know, they're eating up to 35 pounds of vegetation that they're removing every day. Um, and like, you know, geese, uh, they don't have a true stomach. So they're just constantly eating. They're absorbing maybe, you know, 50% of the nutrients and then lots of, lots of waste is being generated and, and left in the environment. And all that extra nutrients can cause algae blooms. It causes the water to go from nice clear water to murky water. We lose that near shore vegetation that small fishes, um, you know, waterfowl use for food and refuge. And so there's just a whole pile of impacts. Um, and they would, they would displace a lot of our native fish species that uh, are of you know, recreational interest as well, impact those. So um, they have a number of different uh, impacts that you know, we really don't want to have happen in, uh, in Canadian waters. So the, that grass carp example and the sea lamprey example kind of speak to the unique abilities of some of these species, the exceptional abilities, things that make them distinct from anything that existed previously in the Great Lakes. Is that what you see with the, these different species of Asian carps? Do they have kind of superpowers that lend them an, an advantage over native species? Yeah, I mean, most invasive species are, are you know, quick to grow. Uh, in the case of these fish, they grow very quick, a couple pounds every year kind of thing. Um, so they soon don't have, you know, predators. Most of our predators of fishes are, are other fishes um, and they become gape limited. So they can only, eat something that they can actually fit in their mouth. So if fish gets too big after a year, it's kind of roaming, you know, relatively unharmed. Um, they, help, they, they reproduce very quickly. They feed in a novel manner where, you know, they, they don't have a lot of competition for resources. So they're out competing a lot of the native uh, fish species. In the case of silver carp and big head carp, they're filter feeders that feed low on the food chain where there's an abundance of food, but that's taking away uh, that those resources from our, our native species. So what is, what's the work that you do, the research that you do to um, understand and address the, the impacts of these invasive species, especially Asian carps? Yeah, so initially it was very much looking at, well, what, you know, is, is this threat real for Canada? So doing a risk assessment to look into, okay, well, you know, uh, we knew um, in the 70s, 80s, that these fish had escaped into the Mississippi and were having pretty traumatic impacts uh, as their populations boom through that system. So recognizing that there's a connection to the Great Lakes, had to really determine, well, is, are these fish actually a threat to the Great Lakes? And so doing a, you know, binational risk assessment, so working with partners, you know, on both sides of, of the lakes, because it's a shared resource, um, really looking at, okay, well, can these fish arrive um, if they can? Do, you know, are they gonna survive? Are they gonna become established? Can they reproduce? Can they, you know, then move through the system? And so, yeah, it was determined, yeah, yeah they can survive. There would be an abundance of food. They, you know, there are um, uh, appropriate conditions for them to reproduce. And so the threat was significant. Um, and especially if nothing was done. So, um, you know, the federal government recognized that and created a, a pilot program for Asian carp in uh, 2012. And then, you know, subsequent years, we, you know, we outfitted the program. We went out um, and part of my, my component of the program, um, so, sorry, it's a, it is four pillars to the program, prevention, early warning, response, and management. And mine is very much focused on the um, early warning. So, and that's about getting out there and doing the sampling that we do. Um, and so this, the picture that we put up shows some of the traditional gear types that we use when we're, uh, we go out and do our sampling. So we modeled kind of the um, highest risk areas. So the, the places most suitable for Asian crops where they're likely to show up first. And that's where we go and focus our efforts um, when we go at sampling. Um, so this shows some photos of uh, the different gears that we use because we do we sample the full fish community while we're out there because we want to be able to detect if they're juvenile Asian carp or if they're adults. So we use a variety of gears. Um, we do uh, digital photos of the fish that we capture or we take, we keep voucher specimens, uh, which we will later identify in our lab and then ultimately send to the ROM to be, to be verified and cataloged. So that's part of our, our connection there too. Um, 
And, but if we do come across a fish, then we go into response. And so we have, there's a, another photo after this um, with our teams that have been out during a response. And so a recreational angler um, had caught a uh, grass carp, uh, didn't recognize what it was, but did take a photo and posted it on social media. Uh, we had people that came across it, identified it. We followed up with the angler and determined, you know, where it was and where it was released and went out and did our targeted sampling. So using the gears that we, we know are effective in detecting these fish. And so um, it wasn't just one fish at the, at the end of our response. We were there for a little over a week. We had removed 10 grass carp from uh, the Lake Gibson system. So uh, just showed like kind of the, the success we had in, in going in there and finding them and removing them. Um, and there was, you know, no evidence of, it was all, only adult fish, no evidence of, uh, you know, any juveniles or anything like that. So, um, you know, after several days of not collecting more, we moved on and, and went back to our surveillance work where we go and, you know, check those other priority areas to keep an eye out. Um, we have another photo of uh, response that we did in um, Tommy Thompson Park. So uh, uh, grass carp had been collected there during a fish rescue from some of the ponds when they were being filled in. And um, we went in and you know worked intensively, worked with partners from the province uh, of, of Ontario, the MNRF, and uh, as well as the Toronto and Region Conservation Authority. So as an example of four uh, very expensive electrofishing boats, we don't often have that many out together, uh, but we were working you know hard to, to cover off uh, the, the areas around there to see if there were any more fish and, and, and get them out. And in this case, we did not collect any additional. Well, it's pretty scary seeing all these big grass carp in the area, uh, given the threat that they pose. Or do you have any evidence that they're reproducing in, in these systems and, and um, you know, generating juveniles? Um, so grass carp is the only one that's reproducing in, in the Great. So in the Western basin of Lake Erie, um, there's the Sandusky River and Maumee in Ohio. And they have collected eggs and uh, larval fish from, from those systems. So we know they're reproducing there. Um, there's no evidence of uh, reproduction in, in Canadian waters, um, but we're you know, continuing to look for, for that. Um, again, our focus is very much on finding them before they have that, op excuse me, that opportunity to reproduce. Um, yeah, so that that's where we're at. And then in the case of silver carp has never been caught in the Great Lakes, not, neither has uh, black carp. And there were, you know, three big head carp very early in uh, the 2000s and ne uh, none have been captured since. So, um, yeah, grass carp is the imminent threat right now. They're they're in the system, but not um, not reproducing. Only only evidence is in two, you know, Western Basin uh, tributaries at the moment. So it seems like you're really just the, the Dutch boy with his finger in the dike trying to stem this uh, potential flood in, into the Great Lakes. No, I mean, we're, there's so there's a lot of effort going into it. And the nice thing is, you know, it's not just us. We have a lot of partners involved as well. So we work very closely with, um, you know, the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources uh, and Forestry. So we do the traditional surveillance with our nets and and electrofishing and gears like that. They're doing environmental DNA work where they'll collect water and actually look for bits of DNA that is shed from fish. And, and um, so they're doing kind of an early detection surveillance in, in that way. We also partner with Toronto Region Conservation Authority to um, conduct surveillance work and tributaries around the uh, Toronto region. And then, you know, we have a lot of other partners that we engage with as well, such as the ROM, the Invasive Species Center, um, Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters, uh, Ontario Cottagers Association. Um, so a number of groups that really helped, you know, to get the word out, right? And that's what we want to do is engage people because, yeah, of course it is, you know, it's a very big system. We're focusing our efforts on those highest priority areas, but ultimately, you know, our, our key to success is um, having as many eyes on the water as possible and getting people engaged and recognizing the, the issue. And, you know, we're more likely to, to, to be successful with the, the more um, engagement we have. So we've, uh, we've got about a hundred pairs of eyes here on the screen uh, in the audience. What are some things that, that the listeners and, and other members of the public can do to, to help uh, with, with this effort? Yeah, very, very much, um, you know, uh, learning how to identify the different species. So um, we um, really want to make sure people, uh, yeah, exactly, you can, can use the identification guides. Um, 
but are able to tell uh, visually, you know, what do these species look like? So uh, this is a silver carp in this example. So um, part of my training and opportunities in the U.S. was to work hands-on in learning about uh, these species, and, and so a great opportunity to see them. Uh, silver carp here, and the next photo is a uh, uh, big head carp. Um, so again, big, big fish, big issue. Um, but again, the imminent threat right now is, is grass carp in the Great Lakes. And so if the public can um, engage in, in, you know, identifying these species, you know, we have a lot of people that use the, you know, the shoreline recreational users, commercial fishermen, uh, recreational anglers. Um, so if you can, you know, identify these fish, take a, take a, a picture, there are uh, different opportunities for reporting it through the invasive species hotline, which is a, uh, a 1-800 number, 1-800-563-7711. Um, so you can report like where you saw it, uh, when, and, and yeah, if you can get a photo for us to confirm, then that's ideal. And then there's Ed Maps as well, which is another um, um, app that can be used for reporting sightings as well. So those are a couple of things. And then students, um, you know, we rely very heavily on having students in our program and helping to deliver our field program. and those who are interested in, um, you know, being uh, exposed to more environmental work and fisheries work, then I, you know, highly recommend applying to the Federal Student Work Experience Program. And again, we do a lot of hiring, we do a lot of training, you get a lot of great exposure to um, fisheries work. And, you know, that's how I started my career was back at the, as a student, not even knowing that there was such thing as a, you know, fisheries career. So, uh, it was a wonderful experience and, you know, even improves your grades. Uh, it's a bit of a motivator to do better and compete a little better for those jobs. Absolutely. Great summer job. Um, yeah. Well, we've got a few questions rolling in uh, from our audience. Um, we have someone asking, what should they do with a sea lamprey attached to a salmon caught in Lake Ontario? Remove and kill it? What's the best way to handle these when you encounter them in nature? Yeah, yeah, definitely remove and, and dispose of. It's, again, important to identify and make sure it is uh, truly a sea lamprey. We have some other, you know, there are other lamprey species in the Great Lakes too. So it's important to properly identify those species and make sure it is, uh, you know, invasive sea lamprey and then, um, yeah, dispose of them pro uh, appropriately. And... Uh... John Racine says he was surprised to see how large the grass carp get in the in the Great Lakes. Are they among the largest fish species in the, in the lakes? Um, yeah, they do. They do get very large. Uh, I mean, there are other obviously large species, the the um, sturgeons and I mean, common carp get quite large as well. Um, it's not so they can get up to 80 pounds, I would say most of those that we've captured uh, are more in the, you know, you know, 20 to 40 pound range. Um, so it would take them a while to get to that, that 80 pounds, but yeah, they are very large fish. And that, that's one of the challenges too, right? Is there, there are no predators for those fish when they're that, that big. So they quickly outgrow the, the native predators and, and then, you know, the bigger the fish too, the more eggs they produce, the more offspring they produce. So, and the more food they eat. So that's all part of the, the risk there. Sure. What, what is it that, that you all do with those big fish when you get them? Yeah, so we immediately go into a response uh, protocol. So if we come across a fish, then, you know, we bring that back to our, our lab space in Burlington. So um, we have a lab space in the, the Canada Center for Inland Waters under the, the Skyway Bridge in Burlington. Um, and in the lab, we have a, a flow cytometer, it's called. So we can take uh, blood samples or the vitreous fluid from the eye. Um, and from that, we can determine whether the grass carp um, is able to reproduce or not. So they are used um, intentionally in, in the US in some cases for removal of aquatic nuisance vegetation. So they can be released into ponds and things like that, um, as opposed to mechanical or chemical means of, of ridding your pond of vegetation. Um, the risk there, though, is that then they can escape into the wild and, and that ability to remove vegetation occurs when they're in the natural environment, too, where, where we don't want that. Um, mm -hmm. So it's very, very important for us to determine are they capable of reproduction or not. So many of the states only allow them if they're triploid fish, they've been sterilized, they have an extra set of 
genes, so they can't reproduce properly. And for us, we had, you know, we determine that right away, bring it back to the lab. And then we can dissect different parts of the fish as well to determine age. We can kind of determine like where they were from. Were they from, you know, the southern states as a farm fish and escaped, or were they likely born in the Great Lakes and, and have kind of moved through the lakes? So um, that, that's all part of our assessment. So, so Janet asks, um, as you're searching for invasive carps, are you finding and removing other invasive uh, fish species like round gobies, common carp, goldfish, et cetera? Yeah, we do come across other invasive, and when they're they're captured, they they are not returned. So any any of the listed and uh, species are are removed. We come across more rudd recently in in the um, eastern basin of Lake Erie. So you know those are removed as well as gobies. So yeah, if, you know we obviously we want to uh, you know we're doing a full fish community assessment, so we're coming across everything, and we try to sample and process fish as quickly as possible. That that fish that are supposed to be there are returned um, and those that are not are, are you know, uh, euthanized. And um, so we, we do remove um, other invasives when we're out sampling. So in addition to, to early detection and, uh, and physical removal of these fishes, um, um, uh, Michael and Muriel ask, um, can we use DNA, hormones, or similar things to stop the reproductive cycle of these particular invasive species? Are there some other higher tech or more complicated methods that we could use to, to, to prevent the, the spread of these species. I mean, the, the, and you know, that's something I didn't touch on enough is, is some of the, you know, partnerships we do with academia as well. And so there is a lot of research ongoing and there's, you know, government uh, groups as, you know, federal and state agencies in the U S that we partner with. Again, it's a shared resource. They have lots of research going on. There's different, uh, academic institutions that are doing a lot of research. Um, it's not all necessarily, you know, hormones or different things like that, but looking at other, you know, non-physical barriers that we could use. So kind of the Achilles heel to these fish is they need flowing rivers to spawn in. They, they swim up river a certain distance. They, um, you know, release their eggs. The eggs have to remain in the flow suspended until they reach the bottom of the river where they uh, ideally would hatch out in a wetland area. So, if we can come up with ways of, of, you know, at the time when they want to spawn, kind of blocking off that river using, you know, be it bubble walls or sound wall or electricity or carbon dioxide, there's, you know, a number of different things that are being researched. And that's an opportunity, you know, one way that um, we could help to reduce those populations. Um, yeah, a lot of the genetic work is, is, um, is tricky as well, because it's, you know, you don't want to be accidentally impacting other species if they get affected by that hormone or some kind of you know genetic um, tactics so so it's all stuff that there's a lot of risk assessment that goes into all of these different um, possible scenarios for dealing with these species yeah so um, someone asks uh, are, are these invasive carp edible is, is that an option for for when they're discovered and, and removed from the lake um, yeah, supposedly they, they I can't uh, speak from experience, but um, they do, they are a tasty. So it, the, there's a real effort going on right now in um, Illinois, a, a rebranding because most people hear carp and think, okay, that's not for me. If, you know, you think bottom sucker and uh, uh, it's going to taste like mud or something like that. But, um, you know, they are filter feeding fish, the, the big head and, and silver carp. Um, it's a light flesh and, and supposedly, you know, relatively tasty. So they're going through a rebranding there, um, naming the, the species Kopi um, and trying to get, you know, again, uh, the public aware of this alternative food source that is good. And but, but I mean, that's very specific to an area where they have a lot of these fish, right? They're a big problem. They're there in high numbers. Um, it's an opportunity for, for food where, you know, in our situation in the Great Lakes, we have great fisheries. We have high value, you know, walleye, perch, um, lake trout, whitefish, good, you know, valuable fisheries that we want to protect. And we know those fish are, are very tasty um, and high dollar value. And so our focus is very much on not allowing these fish in in the first place and not having to deal with what to do with them. We want to preserve what we have and, um, you know, focus on that. Yeah. 
So that kind of gets at, at James's question. Um, why can't the numbers of these large invasive fishes be reduced by implementing commercial fishing? Well, and, and I, I, they are to some extent. They are, I mean, there are commercial fishers in uh, the Illinois. I have a couple more photos actually we could, we could touch on. And part of my training uh, when I went down early on was experiencing the work that goes on in the Illinois. So the, at the invasion front, they are contracting commercial fishermen to go in and mm. capture as many of these fish as possible. And so um, in my experience with, you know, doing early in my career, we, you know, used those kind of classic 14 foot boats with a nine, nine engine that maybe I think a lot of cottagers are kind of used to as a kicking around boat. Um, when I went here, I was fascinated to see these, you know, nearly 30 foot long boats with, in that case, that motor is actually a 250 horsepower tiller motor. Um, which is unheard of. I'd never seen anything like that before. But, you know, um, these, these uh, uh, commercial fishers are using as big a boat as possible. They have, they have large nets um, and there's a lot of fish out there. So we would set, you know, hundreds of yards of this net. We, we go into that area, use that motor, rev the engine um, and the, you know, the silver carp get, get scared by the, the noise and they start jumping um, it was, you know, fascinating for me at first just to see this, you know, jumping fish. It, you know, we had 10 that landed in the boat before we'd even touched the net. So I, you know, I'd never experienced fishing like that before. Uh, but it was soon kind of like terrifying. Yeah, we literally filled the boat to the gunnels. And another reason those big boats is there's just so many fish to remove. Sure. Um, but it was, you know, it was terrifying as well to see that. Like, again, funny to see these fish, but it's near miss after near miss of, you know, 20 pound fish sailing by your head. I saw somebody got hit and let me tell you, it ruins your day. Um, so to me, I kind of think of, you know, the great times I had growing up at the cottage in those nice clear waters, you know, doing lots of boating and near shore stuff. And these fish would, you know, completely destroy that. If you're ducking and diving these fish when you're out uh, canoeing or kayaking or, you know, motor boating around, it's, um, you have to wear a football helmet. Yeah, I mean, I mean, being Canadian, I made the hockey gear joke there that I should have been wearing that. But um, yeah, it uh, it went from you know kind of fascinating and funny to like, oh man, we absolutely do not want this situation in Canada. So it was uh, a quick turn of uh, perspective, I guess. Um, sure. Yeah. So Ryan asks about uh, freshwater aquarium fishes uh, and, and the threat they pose. And if there's anything that uh, freshwater aquarium owners can do to ensure that no potential invasive species, fish, plants, or in invertebrates uh, from their tanks accidentally end up in the natural environment. Yeah, well, and, and it's, you know, that is very important. I mean, I, I remember working in uh, aquarium stores when I was in high school and there were very different regulations than um, I remember selling snakehead. I don't know what species they are. The, the problem sometimes with Aquaria too is it's all in common names. So you don't necessarily know exactly what the species is, but it's very important for people not to release their, their you know, pets into the wild. They might feel like they're doing the right thing with the fish that they don't want anymore, but you could really you know, have very significant impacts on, on the natural environment if you release those fish. Um, it could be, you know, just the impact of the fish has, it could, there could be parasites or something else like that. Again, not intentionally doing something wrong, but very important to dispose of pets, uh, properly. Hopefully, you know, you could sell it back to an aquarium store or other enthusiasts or, um, you know, the focus is really just don't, don't release them into the wild. Same with, you know, water garden pets and stuff like that and, and plants. Yep, absolutely. Um, and kind of related to that, uh, um, other species of, of uh, invasive animals in, in, in the Great Lakes region in Southern Ontario, John asks uh, if you're aware of any other, any reptiles and amphibians affecting the Great Lakes ecosystem. Yeah, I mean, our, our focus is very, my focus is very much Asian carp. Um, so, I mean, there, there are certainly um, other invertebrates, uh, for sure, like different types of uh, crayfish and things like that, that are constantly on the, um, you know, that we're on the lookout for other, and, and then fish species as well. So the type of sampling that we do in our focus is very much, you know, um, fish related. Um, and luckily, you know, we mostly see native uh, species when it comes to, you know, reptiles and, and amphibians. So um, you know, we set our nets in a, in a manner that, uh, you know, turtles are either excluded from getting in or that they have uh, an opportunity to, you know, access air and stuff like that. So 
we do process them, you know, we'll take um, notes if we come across them, but um, it's certainly not the focus of, of our efforts right now. Yeah. So a, a specific area question. Uh, someone wants to know if you work in the Lake of the Woods area or if you can comment on any invasive species that might be there. Uh, we don't. I mean, we're specifically Great Lakes and tributaries to, to the Great Lakes. So um, no, my, my apologies. I don't, uh, I can't really speak to that. We have, you know, others that do um, other, in, you know, core invasive uh, species work within Ontario and Prairies region. Um, and so they're more involved in, in the other species outside of the you know, big head, silver, black and grass carp. Yeah, it seem, seems like a pretty restricted Great Lakes problem. It's not uh, such a concern in these isolated uh, cottage lakes, uh, northern northern Ontario. Yeah, the imminent threat is is certainly to the Great Lakes, and that's you know the the focus right now. Um, you know, and we hope to to keep it a uh, you know keep them at bay, stop this invasion, and um, you know it continue to exclude them. So again, there's lots of work going on in Canada and the US and you know we continue to be vigilant in, in keeping these fish away. Yeah. Well a question that I'm I'm curious about uh you know you, you mentioned some of the work down in in uh in the states lower Mississippi basin and and uh these silver carp rodeos where there are fish flying all over the place. What what are uh some other favorite stories from field work all your time out in the Great Lakes? Uh, you must have had some real adventures. Yeah, I've, I mean, for me, um, you know, unfortunately, I don't, I don't get out in the field much anymore. Um, okay. I'm mostly in the office. Um, I got two young kids at home, so I'm, I appreciate that. But I did have uh, many years of, of being in the field. I had, you know, great experiences working with um, species at risk work. So going out and trying to find small minnow species in different areas, looking at where, you know, where they uh, existed, if they're, ex you know, extending ranges and stuff like that. Um, yeah, one great experience too was again when I was able to go out to um, to Illinois and do that training. Um, the next photo will show it is uh, is kind of one of those like bucket list fish where, uh, although you know extirpated from the Great Lakes, I always thought you know I'm going to be the one who's going to find the last one in the Great Lakes. Uh, this this was not the case. This was in uh, the uh, uh, a side channel from from the Illinois River. Uh, but still fascinating for me, kind of one of those fish, uh, a paddle fish that used to be in the Great Lakes is uh, extirpated, but um, just fascinating to 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 get to handle one and see it um, in the wild. So that was that was pretty cool. That it's a very authentic smile in that case. Yeah, I thought it was really cool. That's awesome. Paddle fish are just amazing animals. That, that's a great example of something that, uh, you know, a really distinctive mode of feeding that used to occur in the Great Lakes and is, is uh, you know, overlaps with what, you know, these filter feeding carps, the silver carp, big head carp uh, do also. Um, is, is there any effort to reintroduce paddlefish into the Great Lakes and maybe fill that niche? Uh, that, I, I cannot speak to that, so not that I'm aware of, but um, yeah. But along those lines, I mean, we do, we, we use, you know, buffalo species that are also a filter feeder as, as a surrogate for us when we're out sampling. So, you know, we're really not, um, you know, if they're there, we're hoping we're capturing and removing um, any Asian carps, but uh, they're, they're few and far between, which, which is great in Canadian waters. And so we use surrogate species such as common carp, which is a large bodied, you know, highly mobile fish, shows us, you know, the gear, our gears are working well to detect those fish. Um, and then buffalo are another large bodied filter feeding fish that would probably be more similar to, you know, silver and, and uh, big head carp in their feeding um, strategies. And, and so, you know, for sampling in habitats where we're collecting them and we're, we're getting quite a few, we feel like we're in, you know, the right areas where silver and big head would also um, find it suitable for, for them to feed. So, yeah, it's, you know, using those surrogate species with similar characteristics to, to tell us, yeah, we're sampling the right spots. Right. Well, thanks a lot, David. This has been amazing, really insightful, learning about uh, the, the, the threat that Asian carps pose to the Great Lakes and all the work that you and, and other folks at, at DFO are, are doing to detect these early and to prevent those invasions. Um, well, I uh, think we're at the end of, of uh, our audience questions. So, We'll end uh, just a little bit early and um, 
hope everyone has a great afternoon. Thank you for joining us. We hope to see you again soon. Details of uh, more upcoming ROM at Home online programs can be found on the ROM's website and our social media channels. So uh, thank you to David and uh, everyone have a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.